All right, welcome everybody to Kanima's Be Well podcast, or as we like to call it, a chain cafe in the morning. And special surprise guest, we have our registered dietitian with us, Rosanna Walsh. Please introduce yourself. Nice to see you both. Roseanne Walsh here, registered dietitian working with Kanima. I've been working with Kanima for a few years. I have a couple of different dietitian roles that I play. I have a private practice and I also work um, for a company called NutriSense doing CGM work. So I kind of have my hand on a lot of different areas of nutrition and hopefully I can add some good insights and answer some good questions that come in from the group. Well, very exciting. We're going to love to hear. We have a whole plan, by the way. Today, we're going to be unraveling the question and the, I would not say it's a really big issue, but it is something that does raise concerns every now and then. The dad bod is one of the biggest trends in what we see in social media today. And, well, I'm not going to lie to you folks. I have somewhat of a dad bod. No. <laughs> But mine's a functional one. Let that be known. It can squat. It can hinge without pain. It can lift heavy items. But am I going to go to the beach and take off my shirt? It's probably going to be a little hesitant. I'm not going to lie. So you can wear a swim shirt. It may wear a swim shirt. <laughs> and it might be a loose one. You know? <laughs> but yes, that is one of the questions we got is what is a dad bod in your – no, what would you classify it as? Just I wouldn't, I wouldn't classify it as, you know, a fully unhealthy thing. It's kind of just like what dads tend to, you know, morph into, um, you know, they still have that, you know, the supposed quote unquote dad strength. So, you know, dads are just unbelievably strong in like the weirdest ways possible. Um, like I know I've seen like a lot of videos like growing up of like superhuman dads just doing weird stuff of like saving their children from injuries um, right. and stuff. But it's still that, you know, you're still strong, still a little bit of muscle under that, but you got a little bit of a, a little bit of a gut. I get it, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, those dad bonds are underratedly strong. Like, the longer the white socks, the more the strength. It's really, <laughs> my dad had it too, and uh, he did develop a little bit of a gut. So a dad bod is, uh, to me at least, not something where I'd be like, oh my God, you are the worst. But something where I'm like, hey, we can still be somewhat better, somewhat a little bit more conscious about our health. And, uh... As far as how would you describe the dad bod again? So dad bods, essentially, we have a tendency um, in middle age, if, if we're talking about males specifically, to gain weight in the middle section. So having a softer or more rounded physique is, is how I would categorize a dad bod. And typically, you know, it's, it's lifestyle factors and the aging process um, as a whole, some social habits biological changes. These are all things that can contribute to dad bod. But presentation wise, it's a little bit of extra weight around the middle. Oh, yes. And uh, I would say that's perfectly described to you. It's, more it's kind of like the opposite of an hourglass shape from the side. From the side. That's what I think. It's like here and then wide and, and then skinny. <laughs> yeah. Here and then like this, but yeah. it's all right. Uh, Good thing that today we're going to describe is how can we reverse them for those who don't want them anymore. Because there's still probably a lot of people that are like, man, um, at least New Year's resolution is a big thing that I hear when I start this training. Or it's like, I want to lose my gut that I developed or, in a sense, my dad bod. So today we're going to actually, luckily, our uh, great thing about also want to point out that one of the misconceptions, at least in fitness, is personal trainers have all this great nutritional advice and how to gain it. And at least in my professional opinion, I always tell people where I can help you some, but I'm not nowhere near a dietitian. Like I have yeah. an idea and I can't give you a meal plan just because my fitness uh, background kind of like jumps into that, but like a small thing, not the yeah. big thing. So that's the great part of also having a dietitian here where those questions where they give us, now we can really uh, dive deep into them. So uh, what would, to reverse that dad bod, would you say? Because I know you said, um, well, first, let's discuss what causes it. What would cause it? So it's it's multifactorial. It's never just one thing. So cumul cumulative, that's really a tongue twister. <laughs> cumulative <laughs> yeah, really eating. Is. So we're talking about, you know, lifestyle changes that creep up on us over time, right? So dads are typically really busy shuttling kids from 
school to activities and juggling work in between. So hitting the gym might not happen as frequently or consistently as it once did um, post family life, so to speak. So the busy schedules and the more sedentary activities, being in the car more, um, sitting at the office, maybe not having the opportunity to work out, the, the combination of those things can lead to less muscle tissue on the body. And when we have less muscle, our resting metabolic rate declines, we become less insulin sensitive and more insulin resistant. So our ability to utilize carbohydrates from our diet declines or our, our ability to utilize the carbohydrates as efficiently, as effectively as we did when we were more muscular as males declines. So those are two major contributing factors. And then we have physiological changes that occur as a result of declines in hormones like testosterone. So when you have fewer, you know, amount, less amounts of testosterone in the body, you're going to have a more difficult time accumulating muscle tissue, which has that cascading effect on the metabolic rate because it, it then does decline. So, and then you've got lifestyle changes. So drinking alcohol, I know it's a, kind of like a controversial topic because the World Health Organization will say very clearly that no amount of alcohol is considered healthy or safe, despite what we've heard in years past about the benefits of resveratrol in wine. Uh, you can certainly get the benefits of resveratrol in grapes too, but alcohol is a toxin and it's a burden on the liver. And as we get older, our liver is less efficient at detoxifying as well. So you have accumulation of toxins, you have blood sugar dysregulation, and these are all things that cumulatively, here, there's that word again, <laughs> on balance, I'm not even going to try to say it again, on balance, they just kind of like add up. And then what the result ends up being is additional fat as a result of, you know, not being able to burn the carbs as efficiently, and then just not being able to get away with eating the same amount of calories as once one once was able to because they had more muscle on them. So those are the main things. And you've got other things like just age-related muscle loss. So the natural byproduct of aging does include a decline in muscle. We become more catabolic. And this is your lane as personal trainers, I know. But we kind of like, you know, tag team in this area. Uh, the, the lack of um, sufficient amino acid supply to repair muscle tissue becomes problematic since we do absorb protein in a less efficient way as we get older. So we need more muscle. Uh, sorry, we need more uh, protein and amino acids in our diet to compensate for that. And then, you know, we have more stress. So the stress of juggling, um, you know, the job, the full-time job and the, the family life and, and all of that does affect cortisol levels and it does affect blood sugar. And that can also contribute to a picture of elevated insulin, elevated um hormone insulin, which affects our ability to burn fat as well and, and stay lean. So those are some factors. Honestly, those factors probably cause my bad bond too, to be quite honest, especially I know like beard and one of the things you said, but on beautiful days and beautiful weather, sometimes I just want to be out there and enjoy a nice happy hour. So I'm victim just as much as I'm at fault just as much as that too. So I definitely get that. Luckily, the stress doesn't get me at work because I have one of the best jobs. I'm okay? <laughs> one of the best people. Now, for those who uh, went down that path, right, what would be the best ways or at least the best advice in your opinion to try to reverse what we have done so far? So or reversing dad bod, there, there are multiple things that we can do as far as our daily lifestyle patterns are, con are concerned. Incorporating weight training is certainly an important change if somebody's not already using weight training as part of their exercise routine on a regular basis doing it at least two to three times can help boost the resting metabolic rate it can help to you know improve the way we respond to glucose and and blood sugar um, spikes so you can get away with eating more carbs essentially is what that means 80 percent of the glucose in our bloodstream is absorbed by our muscle tissue it is more likely that you can dispose of glucose more efficiently if you have more muscle on your body. Doing some high intensity interval training is also beneficial. There are 
you know, studies out there that demonstrate that doing some HIIT training can help improve the production of growth hormone and testosterone, which as we said, does decline. Modifying our, our intake. So in terms of diet, watching our macros, making sure that we're limiting processed foods and high carbohydrate foods, especially without a macro balanced picture. So whenever we do consume carbohydrates, making sure that we're having healthy sources of fat and protein alongside them to mitigate any kind of blood sugar spikes, drinking plenty of water so that we can help the process of detoxification and also just keeping our blood sugar balanced, keeping our appetite satiated. Sometimes we think we're hungry, but it's really just needing to hydrate. Getting enough um, sleep can really be useful. Um, all of our muscle repair work and fat burning predominantly takes place in a fasted state overnight. So ensuring that we're capitalizing on the window of deep sleep, which occurs between 10 p.m. and midnight. A lot of people don't even go to bed until after midnight. So that's a missed opportunity right there. And, you know, it's really a chance to wake up the next day feeling refreshed and put it's like hitting the reset button on hormones, including insulin and all of your digestive enzymes etc. So those are just some examples of things that can be done. Everything you named out something like everything I have to improve on. <laughs> I went to bed yesterday. <laughs> One. Ah, oh, man. Yeah, I'd be better on that. So uh, as far as that goes, sleep, uh, what, would, what would you categorize it in your opinion would be the most important one? Like if you had to only pick one to really take care of, it would be sleep, it would be getting macro, it would be uh, strength training. For the, What would be in your professional opinion? The one, if somebody had to do something, this is what I'm begging you. Um, by and large, even though I'm a dietitian and I'm all about the food, sleep is going to trump everything every time. So if somebody is chronically sleep deprived, if they're chronically missing out on that window of, you know, 10 p.m. to midnight when you get the most possible deep sleep, that's when the glymphatic stage of sleep occurs. So there's this cellular cleansing that occurs within the, the brain, um, growth hormone production, testosterone production. If you're missing out on getting enough sleep, that is the area that I would address first. And I, I know I have this question a lot from mine, which I try to explain, but I probably can't explain it as well as you can. Um, when you said macronutrients, micronutrients, a lot of people, at least when I'm telling them, it's like, you gotta get your macros in, they really don't understand what that truly means. Especially for those that have bad blood, how uh, could I go about it, explaining it better in a sense of, hey, this is what macros are, this is what micros are, this is uh, how it helps your body, this is why you need to take this more than that, uh, et cetera. Sure. Great question. I, I answer this very frequently with my clients as well. So we have three major macronutrients. We have protein, we have carbohydrates, and we have fat. The balance of those macronutrients is essential at mealtimes because they will dictate what happens to your blood sugar at each meal. What happens with your blood sugar is what's going to dictate whether you store calories as you know fat or whether you burn them as fuel. Now, having a meal that is too high in carbohydrates and not high enough in protein and fat will lead to a blood sugar spike and more likely that you'll be storing fat in that either in that meal or just the inability to tap into fat stores, which means that if it's chronically done, you're not metabolically flexible. You want your, your metabolism to be flexible enough to tap into the thousands of calories that we have stored on our bodies in our, in our fat stores for fuel. That's what it's there for. If you can't tap into it, it means that you're a sugar burner. You're somebody who's so conditioned to wanting carbs because you, you're on this blood sugar roller coaster all the time. Your insulin is always elevated. And if your insulin is always elevated, your body can't burn fat for fuel. Yeah. So, so in right. a nutshell, you know, protein, carbs, fat, essential at every meal, the balance of which you would consume all of those varies based on activity level, based on whether you're pre-diabetic or other health conditions, uh, your age does play a role and the type of physical activity you do. So if you're very active in the gym and you're weight training a lot, you will be requiring more protein. If you've recently suffered 
any kind of an injury or maybe you're going through a, a cancer treatment protocol, you're more catabolic when you're in a disease state and you're going to need more amino acids at that point. As I mentioned, as we age, we absorb amino acids less efficiently, so we need more to account for that. And one of the reasons why we absorb them less efficiently is we have lower levels of stomach acid. So to break down amino acids, we need robust stomach acid. Our digestion quality tends to decline as we age too, so that's also a consideration. Yeah, I had kind of, I don't know if it's really like a, it's not too far off the beaten path of it, um, but I, um, one of my former bosses was a mentee of uh, Charles Poliquin. Um, and so I get a lot of my like training principles like from Charles Poliquin, kind of just how I kind of run things. Um, but I've seen many videos in Charles Poliquin like after he's passed away, um, basically of him talking about diet and nutrition. Um, and he talks a lot about how he would basically give people diets based off of their ethnic background and talking about like kind of like their heritage, like basically a lot of Nordic people respond very well to fish and not a lot of grains. So he basically tends to not give them a lot of carbs versus someone that is from maybe from the Middle East where they're like very uh, situated on grains and stuff from like their past. They don't respond well to a higher protein diet. I just kind of want to see what your take is on that. Yeah. I think there's so much, um, there's not a lot of research or science to support what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. However, as an integrative and functional dietitian, I am very focused on working with folks one-on-one -on -one for personalizing their nutrition. So having said that, I don't always rely on a study that was conducted with 10,000 people that was yeah. randomized, controlled trial, like gold standard study. I don't need to see that research necessarily. Mm -hmm. So I will work closely with my clients to understand how are they responding to different foods? What are their genetics? So what you're talking about pertains to how we evolve as human beings over time, over the course of many years. So we are the makeup of, of our nutrition, right? So over the course of generations, if our gene line is very clean and it's clearly from the Mediterranean or clearly from like a landlocked country in Europe, maybe the foods that were consumed were more meat-based or maybe they were more pescatarian or more vegetarian, what have you, there's definitely going to be a, a propensity for us to have better absorption and better response to the foods that our ancestors ate. It's, it's definitely something that I've seen in my practice and it's something that I've seen personally from myself my family is from the Mediterranean, they're from Italy. And I, when I go to Italy or when I consume mainly the foods that we consumed growing up, I always feel the best. And there could be many reasons for that. Part of it could be just like emotional, right? But I think there's a lot of um, truth to that concept. And like I said, it's not necessarily something that you'll find in a study or something that could be proven, but the N of one model where you're working one-on-one -on -one with somebody and you're calibrating macros or food, you know, in different ingredients in their diet to fine tune and figure out what, what they feel best on. Uh, that's, you know, that's the, the end goal. And there are, I mentioned, I work for NutriSense. I'm, I'm not in any way trying to say that everyone needs to be on a continuous glucose monitor, but if you wore a continuous glucose monitor, you would have insights into how am I responding to these different foods from a blood sugar standpoint. Now, an elevated blood sugar is going to mean more inflammation. A lower blood sugar is going to mean less inflammation and better likelihood that you will be in a fat burning mode. Yeah. So if somebody is responding positively to a meal that is primarily vegetarian based, lots of legumes, lots of beans, lots of fiber, great. They, there, there could be very well be a genetic reason because of the way they evolved in their gene line to digest that food better. We can't discount the role that the microbiome plays there either. So we've got trillions of microbes that live in our gut that we live symbiotically with that have a huge say in what happens to our nutrition when we digest it. 
Are we going to extract more nutrition from the food or less? More calories or less? Is it going to make our blood sugar go high or low? Are we producing metabolites? Short chain fatty acid, butyrate, propionate, all these things are dictated based on who's living in your microbiome and how much is there. So it's, it's kind of complicated, say, but. Yeah. I mean, this this stuff, I, I love it just because there is so much to it. It's not just protein, carbs, fats, um, which is like, I guess, to the general population, you know, they just think it's protein, carbs, and fats. Um, but would you say that, since we're talking about dad bods, if a guy came to you, dad bod, would you, is like 90% of like basically the cause of their dad bod or like 90% just commonality between everyone that comes to you is that they have too many high glycemic carbs. Like it's blood just sugar balance. balance. It's, always, yeah. it's always about the blood sugar. It's about naked carbs. Am I eating too many carbs without balance? Like if you're eating an apple by itself, okay, it's healthy. It's an apple, it's healthy. Mm-hmm got fiber, nutrients, vitamins, but what's it doing to your blood sugar, yeah. right? So you can eat something that's whole and natural, but it still could be making your blood sugar go up and counterproductive for your goal. If you have that, maybe you, if you have the apple with almonds or, or nut butter, it's a less of a spike, but maybe yeah. you're going to be spiking regardless. Maybe apples are not ideally designed to, you know, or the best food for you, maybe b- berries, which By and large, berries have a lower glycemic effect. Yeah. So are you better off with the berries, right? And and I would work with each client to kind of calibrate how much of the food, what should they be eating it with, and what's it doing to their blood sugar. Whether they have a monitor on or not, there are ways that we can figure that out. But Mm -hmm. the blood sugar balance is, by and large, the thing next to sleep. Because if your sleep is deficient, then you're going to wake up the next day and be dysregulated. Your hormones, your stress hormones, your cortisol, all of that's going to be off. And your insulin will be off. Your appetite regulating hormones will be off. And then you'll overeat because you won't have that leptin, which is the satiety hormone, to say you can stop eating now you're full. Yeah. And, and the ghrelin will be out of control. You'll have elevated ghrelin, and the ghrelin is the hunger hormone. So most people, if they've had a poor night of sleep or late night of drinking and stayed up late the next day, they typically will want carbs and more food, yeah. and it's a noticeable change. Yeah. And I think that's also like a, a thing where it's like, if you're ever feeling like hungover, I think that the thing that people tell you is like, oh, you got to eat like some carbs to soak it all up, where it's like, it's not, I don't think it's the best piece of advice, I guess. Not at yeah. all. Yeah. You're, you're actually but, throwing more fuel to the fire. Yeah. One of the things uh, you said as people are breathing, which comes to uh, my next uh, question as well, is one of the things um, is how do they practice? Because um, sometimes people just eat you know, because they are bored or things like that, and they don't have uh, patience to wait for the next meal or stay on the diet or things like that. So what would be uh, your advice to try to uh, get them consistently to stay on their diet? So they don't try to waver away from it and be like, well, uh, I mean, I was good for Monday through Friday. I probably should go out and enjoy a nice beer with a burger on Sunday because, well, you know, like I was very disciplined and uh, things like that. So I think what happens frequently is people have this very extreme approach with nutrition and they try to make too many changes at once, either following some type of fad keto plan or something that's just not sustainable. That's number one. Number two, not allowing themselves to enjoy their food. So I always like to adopt the 80-20 rule when I make a recommendation where, you know, 80% of the time the meals are macro balanced and clean and everything, you know, perfectly aligned, but 20% of the time just don't worry about it as much. So if you give yourself that space and that freedom to enjoy, the likelihood that you will go off the deep end declines because you don't feel so restricted and you have a little bit more control and freedom with your nutritional intake. Very well put. Um, So also with the diets and things like that, one of the things I wanted to get to as well with dad bonds is uh, one of the 
think underrated things when it comes to the health are colon and prostate cancer preventions, things like that when it comes to it. Now, protecting your uh, colon and uh, prostate, because I have a few people that I know as well who have these issues and a lot of their diets don't really spark me as, wow, you're giving yourself the best health. So how would you uh, recommend the diets to try to at least avoid or help combat these issues? Well, so I don't mean to sound like a broken record. I already mentioned the alcohol, okay. but alcohol is a, a main contributor to cancer. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's definitely something that people need to be more aware of that alcohol does contribute to the formation of cancer cells. So, um, and, and the mechanism behind that. So we've got alcohol as a toxin, your liver needs to detoxify that. Um, there's certainly this, you know, chance as you get older, your liver gets burdened. We can only be handling so many toxins at once. We're exposed to toxins in so many ways in our lives, right? Yeah. The air that we breathe, the water that we drink, there's chemicals in our food, there's pesticides. Our liver is busy, right? Doing all these yeah. things. Even if you're drinking coffee, like your liver needs to metabolize that caffeine. So you throw alcohol into the picture and that's another toxin. So just being really mindful of your toxic burden as a whole. Even the BPA plastic, the BPA yeah. in plastic, if you're buying shrink wrapped zucchini as opposed to zucchini that's sold standalone, you're getting a little bit of BPA with your zucchini every time it touches that plastic. There are microplastics that make their way into your food. Um, wrapping your, your foods in plastic or putting them in plastic bags just thinking about all those things, knowing yeah. that there's accumulation, right? Oh, I said the word. I said it. <laughs> I knew eventually it would come. So, Maybe you're just digesting something and it finally yeah, came through. I know. I'm on a roll now. The um, microbiome health is really important to think about. So one of the best ways to prevent diseases like cancer is ensuring that your inflammation level is low. When you are thinking about feeding your microbiome, the microbiome will reward us if we properly nourish the microbiome for diversity and for um, anti-inflammatory benefit. So there's trillions of different like bacteria that can live there. All these species, we're, we're just learning. We're, we're on like the, the top of the, the iceberg. They're like trying to like just learn all about it. And uh, we've got lot, a long way to go before we're feeling really like we really understand what the role of the microbiome is in terms of our ultimate health and outcomes. But we do know enough to know that if you don't have certain types of bacteria, you're missing out on the production of these short chain fatty acids that bring inflammation down. So populations like uh, bifidobacteria, lactobacillus, acromantia, those are just a few. And mm. I do stool tests with my clients all the time to assess what's going on inside their gut. Do they have the right levels of healthy bacteria? Are they overburdened by unhealthy bacteria or yeast or you know different types of um, things that can grow? Sometimes people have parasites or they have infections of H. pylori. H. pylori can lead to a cancer diagnosis um, you know, a stomach cancer. There's different types of cancers associated with overgrowth of different type of bacteria. But by and large, if you're fueling your microbiome with the rainbow of plants that are available to us at the grocery store or farmer's market, then they have the food that they need to thrive and they reward us by producing these metabolites that bring inflammation down. So this is exactly why eating the rainbow or eating an apple or whatever it is, Pick your plant, just eat lots of color and do it regularly so that you're producing the short chain fatty acids and you're bringing inflammation down in your body. And also you're excreting regularly. So I don't think we talk enough about the importance of regular bowel movement. So if you're not going at least once a day, you are constipated and that's always a surprise to my clients. But if you're holding on to stool in your tract, your digestive tract at the, at the bottom of your digestive tract in your colon, 
you are going to reabsorb those toxins that are meant to be excreted. And when you're reabsorbing toxins, that's more work for your liver. And that's potentially overburdening your liver in, in the sense that bad things can happen if your liver is yeah. overburdened, right? So those are just a couple of things. And then limiting consumption of anything that's processed that might have additives that are known to be carcinogens. So there are nitrates in cured meats that we can be avoiding. Um, choosing meat that is grass-fed versus meat that comes from a, you know, a larger operation where the, the animals are not eating mm -hmm. grass, maybe they're eating corn, GMO corn. If you're eating chicken, it is ensuring that it's pastured chicken. The difference there is you're getting more omega-3 fatty acids versus omega-6s. And keeping that profile in balance is important, that ratio, because um, omega-6 can be inflammatory if it's in yeah. if it's out of you know balance with the ratio mm -hmm. from what you want. So um, so those are the main things. And I would say like keeping up with your checkups and and yeah. making sure you're visiting your doctor and doing your screens, maintaining a healthy weight. So every time we have excess weight on our bodies, we're storing more like toxins in our bodies and it's a sign that we're not metabolically healthy. Yeah. Making sure blood sugar stays balanced so that we, you know, reduce the inflammation. That's another pro proactive preventative measure. But, you know, for, for prostate cancer, doing the, the PSA test, mm -hmm. there's a digital rectal exam that can be done and, and the colonoscopy for the, the colon cancer. But the things I mentioned as far as cancer prevention with regard to anti-inflammatory anti benefits of keeping blood sugar low, feeding the microbiome, consuming the rainbow, like those, those measures will protect you from a variety of diseases, not just yeah. cancer. I had uh, one thing kind of just going off the inflammatory stuff. Um, I haven't looked too much into it, but I've heard a lot about it just being like this kind of like sports performance world. But about like Tom Brady's like TB12 diet and how they don't have nightshades because those cause a lot of inflammatory response. How, I mean, I haven't looked into it, obviously, but like how much, I guess, truth is there behind it or how much, how effective is it? How much is it like take it with a grain of salt or kind of listen? Sure. I think that's such a great question. So I, I have his book and I've met, I've taken cooking classes with Alan Campbell, who was his chef. Mm -hmm. I was for a period of time, like very interested in learning more about the diet. Um, I think as far as avoiding nightshades, we respond to nightshades differently. So mm -hmm. potatoes, um, like eggplant, tomatoes, like peppers, if you notice when you consume those foods, if you notice any kind of anything that's off, off with your bowels, off with your skin, off with your energy, that could be a sign that you're reacting. If mm -hmm. you're consuming the food cooked versus raw, you might react differently. It's dose dependent too. So maybe a small amount is okay. Maybe a larger portion is not okay. So you kind of have to test and see. And remember that we're all bio individually very unique, but there's definitely an association between nightshades and an inflammatory response in people. Not everyone, but if you're more prone mm -hmm to be exposed to inflammation. So you have to consider Tom's career, right? So yeah. he put himself in a career where he was constantly being, you know, he was taking the hits. He needed to be on his game and he was hyper-focused on reducing inflammation in his body. So mm -hmm. if the average person is consuming a little bit of eggplant and a, you know, eggplant parm once a week, is is that going to throw them off? I, I really don't think so, but... I could be wrong because I'm speaking from, you know, how I would respond to that eggplant. Now I can tell you that I don't, peppers don't agree with me and peppers are in the nightshade family. So I, I personally don't do well with peppers, but just giving you like that context is it, it's, it's very bio individual and Everything you see on social media, everything you hear that celebrities are doing or these expert trainers or nutritionists of the stars, like you just need to remember that their experience is their experience. And it's impossible to dispense personalized nutrition advice on mass. The only yeah. thing 
even when we talk about blood sugar balance, because without wearing a monitor, you're not going to know how you're responding to the apple with the almond butter or with the macadamia nuts or just the apple at all. You won't even know. So you, you can go by your symptoms. You can go by, wow, I just ate that. And five minutes later, I was hungry. Like that's definitely a sign that you spiked and then you dropped. Um, it's, it's always going to be changing too. Like you could have that response the day that you didn't hit the gym. And then the day that you hit the gym, when your nutrition had been on point for a couple of days in a row and your insulin was perfectly balanced and all the stars were aligned and now the apple is fine. So mm -hmm. it's, it's complicated. It's not, it's not really cut and dried as some people make it out to be. Yeah. Well, I think, Actually, all those responses we talked about was, I was going to say Q&A, but you answer a lot of the Q&A that we had from our clients. So now we're actually getting to the end of it, which I hope everybody now understands more of the dad bod and understands more of an approach that, because even I came out a little bit more knowledgeable than what I came in. So hopefully our clients are also after listening more as well. But other than that, I think uh, we also are going to have a comment section for Q&A. So if there's something we did not discuss in this podcast, please feel free to comment down low and we, when we have the time, we will get back to you if uh, we can, unless the questions are too outrageous, like what completely makes me fly is a question, but I probably <laughs> don't have an answer for that. But other than that, um, it's uh, been great talking to you, Len. Thank you so much for making time. Yeah, thank you. And uh, yeah, other than that, um, Diego, Christian, Cafe, Letin, Len, everybody, we will see you on the next podcast. Thank you so much for everything you've shared. Thank you. All right, you enjoy your day. Yeah.